Hi, I'm Claire, and I am a recovered anorexic. One of my earliest memories is when I was, I think, five years old, and I was going to the zoo with my dad, uh, which started out really wonderful. Um, I think we went to the petting zoo, and <laughs> my dad, the goats kept trying to eat my dad's leg hair. I thought that was so <laughs> hilarious. Um, I got to ride on a pony for the first time, which was really wonderful. But at the end of the ride, they take a photo of you with your parent and the pony. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, um, what are those? Polaroids. Okay. Uh, so it comes right out. They give it to you. And I just remember on the ride home, my dad handed back the photo to me. And I absolutely loathed what I saw of myself. And I was five, five years, old. years old. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I actually, I got so upset that I ended up physically punching the photo repeatedly in the back seat. <laughs> what was your dad doing? Was um, he like confused? He was very confused. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I remember him like kind of turning back and being like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And maybe I remember it because it's one of the first times that my dad was kind of like irritable with me because he was like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, and I feel like too, like a dad or like men in general, like it's like they don't know yeah. really how to handle something like yeah, that. Yeah. And no one expects that no. from a five-year-old too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the first memory I have of just really kind of a self-loathing <laughs> within myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, I want to make sure to mention that I have really incredible parents. Um, I'm an only child and they are like my biggest supporters ever. Um, and they're still together today. That's awesome. Uh, but, you know, it kind of contributes to some of the shame I feel around this whole situation because I really had all the support I could possibly want. And it was like my brain chemistry just wouldn't let things work normally for right. me. Um, but like I said, I was an only child. And I can remember because of that, I spent a lot of time kind of daydreaming and in my own little world. I had a very active imagination. And like even we would drive three and a half hours to my grandparents' house and I would entertain myself the whole way just looking out the window and coming up with funny scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, I had little imaginary friends that would like chase alongside the car or glide on like a frisbee next to me, you know, like whatever you could come mm -hmm. up with as a little kid. Um, and that was really wonderful until it stopped being wonderful in like kindergarten when they start actually you know, making sure you're meeting markers for reading and writing. And I just wasn't there, you know. Um, it became really clear that I wasn't paying any attention. <laughs> so it kind of started like going into like when you were in school and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in kindergarten, I just, yeah, I was way behind. And so I was put in a slow learners group. I think they thought I was dyslexic or something. Uh, because I was writing my letters backwards and spelling things wrong. But um, if that wasn't enough to kind of make me a little bit of a weird kid, I was also just kind of, you know, quiet and kept to myself more so. Um, and a lot of kids at that age, I feel like they're very social and hyperactive. Yeah. Um, but that just wasn't me. And... You know, luckily at that point in time, parents were kind of the ones who were putting together the get togethers and stuff like right. that. So the whole like class was invited to things, luckily. So I didn't miss out on anything. But, um, you know, I didn't make any immediate friends. Right. <laughs> and I remember one party in particular. Uh, it was a Christmas party. And we were decorating gingerbread houses. I guess I was eating quite a bit of frosting mm -hmm. in the process because right. obviously why not? you yeah. should. But um, the girl whose house it was actually came up to me and said, 
you know, you shouldn't be eating all that frosting. Um, it's poison and you're going to die. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I mean, she was just a little kid. Mm-hmm. But um, I was mortified. Yeah. Um, Thinking you were going to die. I thought I was going to die. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my mom was there supervising. So um, I can't remember if I like grabbed her and ran to the bathroom or if I just ran to the bathroom and she knew that something was up. Yeah. But um, I was reassured that I wasn't dying of frosting. Mm-hmm. Um, but that story is to introduce to you. This girl that came up and said that to me ended up kind of taking me in as her friend okay. later that year. And I think you can tell it wasn't going to be a super healthy friendship for me. I was just so sensitive and such a serious kid. Um. I don't even know where I got that from. Everything just felt so serious. I was going to say maybe too because you didn't have the sibling aspect of like almost kind of like getting bullied by your older siblings yeah. or something like that or like rough housing. It's – I think it leaves you being more – I'm an only child also. Mm-hmm. So I think that it can leave you to be more sensitive to things in the world and in yeah, life for sure. Yeah, I agree. I hadn't really thought about that as much. No, there was no bullying uh, yeah. of me when I was really right. little. Um, but anyway, this girl, she was just the perfect, like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) six-year-old. She had all the best clothes. She, you know, her mom was a stay-at-home mom, and she was able to put her hair in, like, really cute bows every day. She was also, like, naturally a very thin, like, fit little girl. Mm -hmm. And I was just not that at all. I was never overweight, but I was just, like, a normal six-year-old, you know? Um, Yeah, and I just wanted to be her, basically. And how old were you at this point? I think I was when – I think she befriended me at the end of kindergarten – Okay. And so, yeah, like six years old at this point. Um, and then I also remember there were a lot of like little things that happened too. Um, at one point, her mom was getting rid of some of her clothes. And I indicated that maybe I would want some of them because, you know, I wanted to be her. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember going up to her room and trying them on I think it was like a really stretchy pair of pants and a shirt and I'm sure they were stretched to the absolute max because I was like bigger than her Mm -hmm. but I walked out of that room and I remember just her family laughing and I mean once again that's such a normal thing if someone looks kind of silly it's normal to laugh like they were laughing Because you're wearing the clothes? Because the clothes were, like, stretched really far. Okay. And it was obvious that they didn't fit me. Um, And I don't know. It just felt like there was some joke in the room. I mean, yeah, I I think that, like, a parent should be a little cautious of that. I agree. I agree. I felt like my body was the butt of a joke that I just didn't get or something. Well, I think, too, when when you're that young, we're not old enough. To know if something, if somebody's laughing at you mm-hmm. or some somebody's laughing at a situation. You know what I mean? And yeah. especially I feel like with the mindset that you already had, right. it could easily be confusing. It was you. confusing for me. Yeah. And I remember just feeling very self-conscious back then and even now looking back on it. Um, and then also, you know, my parents, I was allowed to have one – treat per day I guess they called Mm -hmm. it it could be something like a popsicle or whatever but this friend kind of acted like maybe that wasn't a healthy thing um and that made me self-conscious as well do you think her parents kind of like were more conscious of what you know what I mean like of how they were eating and she was eating I I feel like that yeah probably probably because I don't know where else she would get that from I think so yeah but when you're a kid you're supposed to just eat what you want, have fun, yeah. and, you know, so. But there's definitely, I think, some parents and families, unfo- and I, I'll say unfortunately because I, I do think that being healthy is important. I agree. But there's healthy snacks. 
Yeah. And you should always snack. I, I'm healthy, but I like my healthy snacks. Yeah. <laughs> I find them. <laughs> healthy snacks that taste good. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then also, you know, I have some family members in my extended family who really follow kind of like diet trends. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of conversation about like bad foods where I don't think that a little kid should really hear that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, you should focus on nutrition and nutrients and try and encourage the quote-unquote healthier option. But having a negative view around food in general, I think, really messed me up. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. Um, So I kind of, at the same time, you know, um, the big trend was low fat foods. Um, every like food item had the code or the key term, low fat or non fat or whatever. So I just got it in my head that like fats were making people fat, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and I had heard about adults being on diets. And I thought, you know, I could just cut things out and that would be fine. And I would start to look the way I wanted to look, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I, I cut out fat like entirely. And I also, for Lent that year, gave up all sweets. And then after that, it just became like a slippery slope of giving up. So you were so young at this point. Like, did your parents say anything? Like, did they notice kind of? Or did you kind of keep it more to yourself? I kept it to myself okay. very much so until it got to the point where, you know, you couldn't hide it anymore. It. Okay. Um, yeah. I think something in me kind of knew that, I don't know, I guess I knew somewhere deep down that I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. Right. Because my mom would pack me like a lunch with, a sandwich and vegetables and it got to the point where I was just eating the vegetables and throwing out the sandwich Mm -hmm. um, or hiding food items under the cushion in my dining room table. Yeah. Um, So I knew that I shouldn't be doing it. Right. But I couldn't stop at a certain point. Um, I think that eating disorders kind of become a control addiction. You're controlling what's going into your body when you feel like something else is out of control. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it very much became that to me. It was an addiction. I became really addicted to just depriving myself of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, my parents, once I started rapidly losing weight, um, I think it wasn't until I was around nine years old when I was really losing weight, they did step in and were sending me to doctors because I was still kind of hiding everything um, and they couldn't tell what was wrong with me. Okay. Uh, It wasn't really well known for kids to have eating disorders. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, eventually a doctor did diagnose me with anorexia and we tried to do outpatient for a while, but I was just too far gone. I was too stubborn. It turned into just like a family catastrophe, basically, because there was, I was always such a like calm and easygoing kid. Like I said, I was always in my own little world, basically. Um, But I became really defiant as far as food went. Right. And I guess that was kind of my way of like rebelling or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think too, when you have something like set in your mind, like you were saying, the control aspect. Yeah. You're not going to want to listen to anybody else. You know, like even like you said, you even if you know deep down something's wrong or not good, once you're addicted to anything or like at, even if it is a sort of control of something. Yeah. You know, it's going to be hard to just break that, especially if you've – it's almost like I feel like too it was it was built up over time. So at that yeah, point, you're it's, so right. yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it was almost like that was the only thing that was kind of making myself feel good about myself. Mm-hmm. Um, just the fact that it's so backwards, but I felt so strong because I was depriving myself of these things that I wanted and my yeah. body needed. Um, I've always been a person who really likes food too. Right. And I think that's true of a lot of people with eating disorders. Um I I kind of recognized that 
a lot of kids around me were pickier than me and didn't eat as much as me. And that made me self-conscious as well. So I just, you know, started pushing it all away. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I did outpatient for a while and I kept being sneaky about it. So I ended up, I don't know who found the place. But I ended up being sent to a inpatient facility in Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. And where are you from? Again? Michigan. Okay. So it's a, it's a hike. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I can, I can remember I was telling my parents basically they had to, like, tie me up and drag me there kicking and screaming because right. I wasn't going to go. I don't know how – they eventually did convince me, but um, my mom and I went to a hotel near the airport the day before we were leaving because it was an early flight. And I remember um, I my mom took us to a dinner somewhere, and I refused to eat anything other than plain shrimp. Um, and then I spent the night in our hotel just like frantically running back and forth, jumping up and down, uh, trying to burn off those few plain shrimp that I ate. Uh, So I guess, I mean, I think at that point, my mom was just so exhausted from Mm -hmm. arguing with me and she was like, she's gonna be in treatment the next day. She can have this last moment. (laughs) Right. So it started, did you start I guess because when you said that you were like running back and forth trying to burn off the shrimp. So did you start kind of implementing like exercises too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't remember so much at that point. I know I was trying to, you know, run around a lot. Yeah. I think I I had a – well, we'll get into it later. (laughs) Go ahead. Sorry. No, you're all good. (laughs) Um, So we – Went to Omaha, Nebraska. It was a wing on uh, some floor of a hospital. It was within a hospital, a children's hospital. Mm -hmm. And the place was really nice, honestly. Um, It looked pretty medical. Um, But, you know, there was artwork from different patients on the walls and all the staff was really nice. So, it's good. you know, it was a good place. Uh... I had to sit in a wheelchair for two weeks while I was there um, because it's really dangerous for little kids to lose as much weight as I did. Mm -hmm. You know, their metabolisms are so high and they're supposed to be growing. And so that was pretty difficult for me as someone. Like I said, I was compulsively exercising as well. So they just had you in the wheelchair for, wheelchair for safety reasons? Yeah, they okay. didn't want me to burn any more calories. Got it. And they wanted me to take in food and right. gain weight. Um, and it's hard for kids at that age to gain weight too right. because the metabolism is so high. Um, but I was actually like the youngest person on the unit at the time. And I think that really helped me uh, because – I really looked up to all the other girls. I thought they were so cool and they kind of took me in like their little sister. Yeah. So, you know, I really kind of adhered to the program and I I think I was there for like two months. Um, I'm trying to remember everything that happened. I was so young. Yeah. <laughs> but there were a lot of like, you know, therapeutic different things and just group therapy lots of support was there um while you were there did you start having the desire to start eating again and eating more I did yeah yeah because the other girls there around you they were eating as well right so it was kind of like like you were saying you looked up to them in a way yeah it was such a supportive environment and it's amazing yeah, the fact that I really looked up to all those girls really, I think, got me through it. And then I came out kind of feeling like a whole new person, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I got back home and I had a couple of really normal years. I was really boy crazy with my friends. 
I had a really good group of friends at this point. And the girl who was my friend before was still in it. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't hold that against her. And she just ended up being a more distant friend because that kind of dependence on her wasn't healthy. But, you know, up until I, I went through middle school, I started high school and everything seemed great. I had my first boyfriend. I had good friends. My girlfriend group like merged with a group of guys and we were having a lot of fun. I really don't know what happened, but sophomore year, um, something must have like prompted some coping mechanisms in me Mm -hmm. because I started going back to older behaviors. And plus two, I think the older you get, the more you recognize things in the world. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Of like how people think you're supposed to look or what everybody kind of says looks the best, even though there is no such thing, you know, which is hard for us to really grasp and understand. But I think that the older you get, especially in high school, and especially the fact, like I will say, it really does suck. It sucks, but it's just the way of life. But like there are people, even like you were saying that little girl, like there's people that are just like naturally genetically blessed to like look great. And there's people that like you look more so normal But if you, you know, the older you get, it's like some people have to work harder to look like the people who don't have to work hard at all. Yeah. So it's like I couldn't. Yeah. And I feel like it's interesting because like growing up and I I feel like that's the age that too, you kind of start to pick up on these things and and realize, oh, well, she looks different than me or like because that's the age that I remember people. I would start noticing like I had no boobs and everybody else had boobs. And I'm like, oh, well. I don't look as curvy and womanly as the oh, other yeah. 15, 16 year olds, which That's why does it matter? That's a whole nother time, thing yeah. I feel like, and everyone's developing so differently. I know one of my friends had a really hard time having boobs before everyone right. else, you know, it's just so different. For right. Everybody. And it does go both ways. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I know that, uh, For me, restricting can feel like a coping mechanism or something that's comfortable for me because it's something that I learned so young. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I started losing weight pretty rapidly again. And my parents recognized it right away. Mm -hmm. They took me to a doctor to get me re-diagnosed to start getting some treatment. And the first doctor that they took me to looked at me and said like, Maybe she's just a small girl. I think maybe she's fine. Gotta love some doctors. Right? Um, Knowing my whole history and everything like that. And of course, I came out of that being so defiant and being like, see, mom, I'm fine, you know? Plus, too, like, if the parents are concerned, you should trust the parents over everybody else. But, yeah. Yeah. And just knowing that I've already been hospitalized Mm -hmm. for this, that's so bad. But... So that set everything back a little bit because my mom, I think, kind of started to second guess herself too. Mm -hmm. You know, if a doctor is saying that this isn't an issue, maybe I'm making too big of a deal of it. So I did eventually get re-diagnosed and we started trying to do outpatient again. Once again, I was just way too defiant about it and way too stubborn. So what does the outpatient consist of? Is it kind of just like how do they monitor that? Are you just going every now and then or? Yeah, so um, I had a dietitian and I had a therapist. Okay. Um, But I never really opened up to the therapist because I was so stubborn. check-ins kind of Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're not monitored basically 24-7. I mean, my parents were kind of monitoring things, but I was going to school, you know, and I was hanging out with friends Mm -hmm. and I was 16 at this point. So it was hard to really control what I was doing. Yeah. And I just wasn't willing to admit that I had a problem, which is like the whole thing. (laughs) You can't help someone who's not going to help themselves. Yep. So once again, it's an addiction. And I ended up having to go to another inpatient stay somewhere because it was just getting so bad. I was down to around 74 pounds um, as a 16-year-old in high school. 
I looked really thin and really bad. And I could recognize that I looked bad is the thing, too. I could look in the mirror and say, I look like bones right now, and I don't like it. But I couldn't stop. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's not all about, like, the aesthetics or Right. Whatever. It's more like a mental thing. It really is. Right. It's like, like I mean, it's, it's really interesting, too, because I don't think many people relate the addiction aspect to it. Yeah. Because like you just said, that's what it comes down to because it's not like you liked the way that you right. were looking or thought that you looked healthy. And that's that's the worst part about it too is like I feel like you probably got to a point also where you're like, I-, I don't like it, but I can't. I don't even know how to stop it. Right. That's exactly what it is. And I wanted to make sure to say that. I actually read, um, you know, Jeanette McCurdy. She mm-hmm. was Sam and um, iCarly. Yes. She wrote a book and – it was so good. What is it? Um, I'm glad my mom yes, died. I've heard of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so good. I definitely recommend it. She kind of describes how it really becomes such an addiction. Right. And I think too, it's important that people know that because I think it's so easy with anything for people to put labels on things. And yeah. if you don't actually experience something, it's very easy to judge or to not understand. Because even myself, like I didn't realize that aspect of it. You know, it goes so yeah. much deeper than just what the label is. Right. It starts out a certain way. Maybe you don't like however many things about yourself, mm-hmm. but then you just you you can't, know, it, get... Yeah, you can't stop. Get in too deep, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I ended up being sent to a place in Ohio. I don't remember the name of it, but immediately I could tell it was not as nice as the children's hospital. Because you were older now, so it was probably a different... Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's a whole new ball game. So I – it kind of looked like like office buildings almost. Mm-hmm. And there was an upstairs and a downstairs. The upstairs was for the inpatient, like, teens and girls. And the downstairs was for adult group, basically, where people would meet. Um, and the upstairs <laughs> where we were staying, there was one huge bedroom – with like a ton of beds. So you're sleeping in a bedroom with like 20 other girls. And there was like one bathroom. Uh, There was a large like community space and dining room basically. Mm -hmm. And the worst part about this place was that they were like only focused on weight gain basically and not all the mental that comes along with it. Which is obviously like one of the biggest things if not the biggest it is the biggest thing so you know I mean I can I can tell you one day I believe someone else was setting up your your um daily meal plan basically Mm -hmm. and they were just loading you up with one day I was eating um like for breakfast I had a giant bowl of cookie crisp For my snack, I had gummy worms and Oreos. For lunch, I had some giant frozen, like, fajita plate. For another snack, I had ice cream. For another snack, I had, like, a giant hungry man Mm -hmm. meal. Like, no fresh vegetables or fruits. Yeah. And I was going to say, I'm sure that there's a fine line and their reasoning is because they just want you guys to put on weight, which I understand. But at the same time, I feel like, there's a way to balance it and I feel like introduce that you can still be healthy and eat healthy but here's healthier carbs and here's healthier weight right some people probably won't agree with what I'm saying but I already can see it but that doesn't just because I just feel like that doesn't mean that you should just shove the worst shit down somebody's throat you know what I mean and I think too kind of like you were saying with the mental health aspect how can they expect you to really stick to something when you leave if you didn't even get any type of support when you were in there. That's so true. Yeah. And just my whole body was reacting to the fact that there was like no nutrients in what I was eating. It was just so far in the other direction. Um, I was having some bad digestive issues. I can, yeah, I'm sure. And they make you go to the bathroom with the door open because some people purge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I understand that, but I... I was having liquid poop. I'm, the whole saying, I'm about time to shit myself. I, I don't know if you want to hear this. Yeah, exactly. It was just so beyond embarrassing. Right. And my face was breaking out. I just felt terrible. 
Yeah, because all that sugar and horrible shit, it's going to give you other bad shit to deal with. Right. And I feel like that gives you a more negative view around the food that you're eating, too, if it's doing yeah. all of that to you. Ugh, that pisses me off. I know. I know. Another thing that they made you do is um, once you had, like, finished all the food on your plate, uh, there's usually, like, some sauce or whatever left there. They would make you take your fingers and wipe it up and lick it off your fingers. Like every last bit. That is crazy. Yeah, I know. It was so messed up. They, yeah. They did that because like some people will try and like move the food around as much as they can to leave as much right. on their plate as they can. But still, that's just such a messed up like practice to be teaching exactly. people that already have so many issues with food. Yeah. And I think that that's what I'm saying. It's like I know – some people won't agree because they're going to be like, well, this is what the like what they need or whatever. But like there's ways to balance things and there's always a healthy way mentally and physically yeah. to go about doing things. And even just like introducing new, I guess, ideas to people around food and things like that rather than right. lick every last bite up of yeah. the sauce. Yeah. And no um, one piece of that you know, that day that I told you mm -hmm. is wrong, you right. know, eat gummy worms, eat Oreos, eat all of it. But like, if that's all you're eating all day long exactly. with no nutrients, no fiber, and your body uh, no just knowledge. shuts down. Yeah. That's the thing too. It's like, I feel like, and I guess that relates back to as well, the, the mental support of like, there, there's no knowledge because even when you get out of there, it would be nice if you knew just kind of like, okay, well, like, they did teach me, like, really, like, yeah. you know, like, healthier options or more balanced options. You know, I don't even think, like, healthy whatever, but, like, just more balanced. Nutrition, like you were saying, like, there was no yeah. no nutrition. Yeah, so. nutrients are yeah. what it all comes down exactly. to. Exactly. And that's what's going to make you feel better. Right. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I was, like, that pisses me, that part yeah, really pisses me pisses off. Yeah, it pisses me off, too. And I was under the impression that my parents were aware mm -hmm. of, like, all of that, what I would be eating, the fact that it was just all – frozen microwaved stuff um but they weren't and I ended up calling my mom one day just because I was getting so fed up um I didn't really connect with any of the girls there either and I felt like the staff just didn't really care they were just slapping stuff in front of you and they would make you sit until you finished it even if you hated what you mm. had I remember one time I had something that literally tasted like it was rotten like it was bad mm -hmm. and they just had me sit there and like swallow it down right probably too because in their minds they're like well it's probably fine she just just doesn't want to eat it yeah yeah I'm sure that they get that a lot mm -hmm. but it was disgusting well, that's why you don't cheap out on the food <laughs> you know yeah. and then you'll know for a fact for sure actually get us some good food mm -hmm. please right um but yeah, I called my mom and I told her everything and just how I was feeling yeah. both physically and mentally. And she was like, okay, we're getting you out tomorrow. So I really appreciate her for that. Mm -hmm. How um, long were you at that one? I can't remember. Okay. Uh, I think it was nearly a month. Okay. So still a decent amount it of time. It was a decent amount of time. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, I was I was just really thankful for my mom in that moment because I was just so messed up at that point mentally that I thought that, you know, my parents were just sticking me somewhere yeah. basically and they didn't care. Right. But I wouldn't have been put somewhere if they didn't care about mm -hmm. me. You know, they would have just let me do what I was doing. Exactly. So um, then I ended up going to another facility in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And that place was a lot nicer. Um, but starting out, they put you in a like wing of a hospital once again, and it was very, very medical and very like I had some photo frames that I was bringing with me and you couldn't bring the glass part of it in. Hmm. Um, I don't think you could have shoelaces or, you know, razors to shave. It was very... Because there were people who wanted to so hurt like, themselves. Yeah, like suicide watch in a yeah. way it sounds like. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was one kid in particular that had a room across from me. And he, I mean, I didn't get to know his diagnosis, obviously. But I think he was pretty badly schizophrenic. Okay. 
I could hear him like talking and laughing to himself uh, late into the night. And I remember at one point he had to be um, restrained and sedated and he was screaming. Mm -hmm. So I guess that portion of it wasn't so nice. Yeah. Well, I think too, because like we were saying, I think the older you get, the more generalized, like multiple people with multiple different things going on are going to be in one area right he also had an eating disorder right. and was starving himself mm-hmm. um because he he wanted to hurt himself in so many ways that right poor, i i can't imagine his family and mm-hmm. everything how horrible that must be i hope he's okay now but yeah that was really eye-opening yeah obviously um i got through that area of the program and then you're put in like a middle ground kind of situation it's like a, it was almost like a cabin in the woods, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were some pine trees around. It was actually really pretty. Yeah. And uh, once again, we were on the second level, uh, all the kids were. And then the lower level was where adults would meet mm-hmm. for group. And they had real food. They had, you know, fruits and vegetables and all the things. And... There was one other girl there while I was there, which was a little bit odd. Mm -hmm. And she had some pretty unhealthy... uh, Habits? Habits, yeah. She kind of taught me how to, like, exercise in my room without anyone hearing, how to, like, dump some things out when people weren't watching, that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So that kind of drove me further into having disordered thoughts and continuing what I was doing, which is so stupid because that just hinders you from getting out of the program quicker. Which it surprises me that she made it to that level. But at the same time, I feel like you are in such a vulnerable place that especially her being the only other girl there, you're going to kind of lean on that and take in what you're given in a way. Right. So I really learned some unhealthy habits from her. Um. And then actually, you know, we both made it to the end of the midpoint, still doing what we were doing and still kind of fighting everything. And we went to outpatient. And I believe my dad kind of got some temporary housing out there. Uh, So I lived with him and I would kind of take advantage of the situation still. He loves to swim. He's just such a precious man. Mm -hmm. He loves swimming so much and he thinks the world of me and he, I would kind of convince him to take me to a pool to go swimming um, when I wasn't supposed to be exercising at all at this point. Still, I was supposed Mm -hmm. to be gaining weight. You reach a point in the program where they do let you exercise, but I just wasn't going to get there, I guess. I just decided I was going to do what I wanted. So... We would go to the pool and I would act like I was having fun, but I was really just frantically like swimming around. I feel really bad um, just because he is one of my biggest supporters ever. Mm -hmm. Um, Eventually, people in the program found out that, you know, I just wasn't gaining weight. I was doing something weird. Did they monitor your weight? Yeah. Yeah, there were weigh-ins. And, you know, when you're severely underweight, you should be gaining mm-hmm. weight. Um, so I ended up being sent back through the program again. I went to inpatient. Uh, I don't remember there being any. Did you have to start all the way from the beginning? All the way from the beginning. Wow. How long was it with the first process? Do you remember? I don't remember exactly how long everything was. It was like time wasn't real at that point. Yeah. So, but you had us but you had to go back to basically square one. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the same place where they take away all the glass and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I made it through that point quicker this time because I had been through it before. Right. And then I waited made it and then I made it to the midpoint again. And I think this was the worst I was mentally. I was just holding on to everything as hard as I could and exercising in my room and dumping things out. And it was to the point where I didn't even want to ever sit down. I wouldn't let myself sit down. And when the staff would 
tell me, hey, Claire, you've got to sit down. I would do this bizarre thing where I would almost like tense all my muscles and do like a wall sit against the chair. Mm -hmm. Um, And eventually people caught on to that too. One of my favorite staff members one day pulled me aside and said, why are you doing this? You know, like what's going on with you? And at this point I felt like I was like constantly drowning, you know, I was doing everything I could to work against this system that was actually working for me. Like, I wish Mm -hmm. I had realized that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I burst out in tears when he asked me that. And I said, I don't like to let myself enjoy things, which I had never really admitted to myself before. But I think it did get to the point where, you know, depriving myself of food made me feel good. Depriving myself of relaxation made me feel strong. Um, It was like any enjoyment of life at all felt like a weakness at that point in time. So he turned to me and he said, that is the saddest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. And no one had put it to me like that. Right. And I think that was a turning point. Mm -hmm. I started to be like, yeah, it is sad that I'm not with my friends right now. It's sad what I'm doing to my body. It's sad what I've done to my family, you know? Um, And I think I really started to, to try at that point in time. Um, and I, you know, complied with the program. I, made my way through. They actually allowed me to skip outpatient at that point. And I was able to come home. Um, I remember one of my first journal entries after getting out of the whole program uh, and being back in Michigan, it said um, something along the lines of, I will stop hating the person I've been and I will become the person I want to be. And at least superficially when I got out, I feel like I did that. I immediately, you know, started, I I started a new job. I started buying clothes that made me feel good about myself. I had my hair highlighted blonde because I had always wanted to do that. And I kind of decided that I would give myself things to make myself feel good about myself instead of taking things away. Uh, I think after that point, you know, I was a normal, I I was a pretty normal teen girl. I got back into my friend group and, you know, things were good. Were you open with your friends at all with everything that was going on or you really kept it, you kept it yourself? I kept everything to myself. And like to this day, I haven't really told this whole story to mostly anyone. Uh... And I don't know why that is. I feel I have felt a lot of shame around it Mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, Just because I am such a privileged person in so many ways. I have a great family. I have good friends. You Um, can have everything and still, you know, deal with stuff. I I know. I think that's something, too, that is so important for people to know that just because it might look like you have it all or because you have – the support and you have this and you have that, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to struggle with anything, you know, but I can understand why it's very easy to feel shameful about things that you feel like, well, I, it doesn't have to be this way, but I'm putting yeah. myself through it. But it's, you know, but at the same time, coming and sharing it, I feel like should just like lift all of that away because you're going to be helping so many people because I'm sure so many people feel that way as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's my hope. I hope that the story resonates with someone and I hope that actually laying it all out there, you know, makes me feel free in some yeah, way. Yeah, and it should. Yeah. So when you got out of the program, how old were you at that point, like after that program? I was still 16. Okay. It was during my sophomore year. It was a couple of months, maybe three months mm-hmm. or so. Yeah. And then was that the last program that you were in? It was, okay. yeah. So the last time was like, was this successful for you? It was. I mean, I think I have gotten into at least one situation 
in college where I did lose some weight. But at that point, I think I'm able to figure it out for myself. That's now. what I was going to ask you next. If if you're at a point now where it's kind of like, like how you were saying, because it seemed like before, obviously, you would fall back into, you know, the, the patterns. Yeah. And then your parents would be kind of the ones that took action. But right. now, do you think you're at a point where – you take your own action if you see I it do. happening. Okay. I do. I do need um, friends to sometimes kind of check me and yeah. say, hey, you're looking like really thin right now. Because I don't see it myself mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Um, and I do have that. I, I had some friends kind of step in and kind of say, are you doing okay? And then I was able to kind of get back on track. Yeah, which is good too. And, and just as important as family because I think that – even if you have like the best parents that are so supportive, there are parents. And I feel like naturally we don't always want to listen to to our parents because we just feel like they think they're always right, which they usually are. But (laughs) but like I think it's good that you have a good support group of friends as well because you're going to, I think, take their opinions in a little bit faster than you would your parents because they're your age, they're more relatable and everything in between. But so I think that's really important as well. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so since then, um, you know, I went to college and I kind of found, you know, things that I really care about. I started taking classes that I find interesting and that fire me up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I kind of found myself through that, you know. Um, I don't need to, to find all my worth in what I look like or what I put into my body or you know, any of those things, what anyone thinks of me. I like myself because I care about what's going on in the world. Mm. And that's what's important to me. That's the wave that I've been riding ever since. Well, that's amazing. And I think too, something that you said about instead of depriving yourself of things, you started kind of giving yourself things. I think that's another good thing too that people should, obviously it's not going to solve all the problems, but I feel like at the same time, it is kind of a, a better way to cope and kind of help yourself to kind of make that like mental switch of instead of taking things away, give myself things, even if it's little things, you know, that just make you feel good. Because I think when your focus is all on one thing, you know, like food, food, food or something, if you're able to give yourself things in different categories, like you were saying, like classes or something that kind of brings out a happiness and a peace within yourself that – that can help. And I just think that it's so – like I can't tr- stress it enough how important it is because I really do believe that there are a lot of people that think that maybe eating disorders develop because of the media or when you get older. But the fact that it started so young for you kind of shows that it can happen at any age to anybody. Right. And that it's something that – because once again too, when you're that young, parents or, you know, kids – because I, I don't know what my how young some of these people are watching, but I know it varies a lot – but somebody might not even really know because they might think like, oh, well, I'm too young to be having those thoughts or, you know, because yeah. it really, I really do believe that it's something that people don't realize can just kind of come out of nowhere and you don't really have a reason. And then obviously, obviously it can get progressively worse. Yeah. But I just think that's important for people to know because it's not just something that, like I said before, it's not just a label. It's not just you sitting there saying, I want to be skinnier. It like, you know, it, it actually becomes – mentally a struggle for you and something that you want to get out of but almost feel like you can't and you're trapped and also not to ramble but I also want to say how important it is to get help no matter what 100%. because I think that it's easy in life to think like we're so strong and like I know what the problem is so I can get myself mm-hmm. through it but a lot of times we can't and like that's why programs are there and, and unfortunately sometimes you do experience some shitty ones but like there are, that doesn't mean that there's not good ones out there that can really help as well. Definitely. Yeah. I, I don't think I would be here today if I didn't go to the programs that I did go to. Yeah. And I'm so proud of you. And honestly, so grateful <laughs> that this is like the first time that you're really like, you know, talking about your story in detail. It's It was incredible. Seriously. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you for giving this platform to people who really yeah. need it. No, I really, seriously, I think that, I mean, I I always like to tell people this in general, just like off camera, but I'll say it on camera now. (laughs) But like people's stories, there's always someone that can relate, even if it isn't the exact same story or situation. Like there's always something in there that even if it's like 
just a, a completely different mental health struggle that somebody might really relate to it and understand and be like, well, I've felt those ways before and it, I kind of fought the help and fought everything. But if maybe if I just give in and try, you know what I mean? Or like, or find mm. a place within myself that I want to try, you know, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel kind of thing. For but, sure. But it, you did – incredible thank you seriously ah. you should be so proud like and i'm so happy for you and your journey only is up from here you're amazing you're amazing thank, thank you. you of course